Hello and welcome, it's Frank Calabro Jr. And what we're going to talk about today is disruptive technology and the most revolutionary concept since the invention of the internet. Now here was the internet actually in 1977 and of course you couldn't access this internet. You couldn't order it up and get it from Time Warner Cable or one of your internet service providers. Um, but it was very limited guys and actually there was a satellite transmission from London but there was the internet in 1977. Now you know, ask yourself when you actually gained access to the internet. For myself, it was 1997, 20 years after this illustration right here. And I bought my first PC in 1997. And I called up and I ordered internet, guys. And I've been on the internet ever since. But some people, uh, you know, if you're in your young, you're, you know, if you're young and in your 20s, especially your early 20s, you probably have internet your entire life. But if you've been around longer than that, internet was something that came along during your lifetime. It wasn't always here. Now, we're going to talk about disruptive technology and what that is. It's something that displaces an established technology or creates a solution that is so dramatic that it is adopted as the standard. Okay, so disruptive technology. Let's talk about this. Now, the end of the industrial age, in the, industri the, the last part of the industrial age, let's say 1920 to 1959, a lot of the disruptive technologies that came along were actually uh, what I call quality of life technologies, quality of life technologies. And there was a lot of this that was developed around, you know, it started around 1920 and it went forward. And actually, my grandfather was coming up then. Uh, my grandparents, all born in the 20s, uh, grandfather was actually born in 1925, but a lot of these technologies, my grandfather actually seen these things come to life, you know, in his in his early years, you know, uh, something, a lot of this stuff we take for adv advantage, like we just figure, well, this stuff's always been here, but it's not the case, guys. As a matter of fact, these technologies have only been around about 100 years, which is really nothing in a bigger scheme of things, you know, things like the refrigerator, that was a disruptive technology. It absolutely transformed everything, guys. It transformed the restaurant business. It transformed uh, how people store food. I mean, it, it transformed uh, shopping. I mean, everything, guys. It totally transformed uh, the world, that technology. Radio, guys, radio hasn't always been here. As a matter of fact, in 1925, the very first radio transmission came out of the white house the washer guys right of course we take advantage we just throw our stuff in the machine and push the buttons and it starts and right <laughs> but once again a disruptive technology the vacuum the water heater most of these things we take for granted but they weren't always around these were disruptive technologies air conditioning now there's something especially people that live in hot climates i'm telling you you would not be living in a high cl hot climate by choice if there was no air conditioning, uh, totally transformed everything, air conditioning, uh, television, and the jet airliner. But these are, we're at the tail end of the industrial age. We're talking 1920, 1959 time frame. These technologies changed the world, guys, completely changed the world, and they were adopted as the standard. Then you fast forward to what we call the information age, okay? Okay. The information age, a lot of people say we live in the information age now, and that's true, but we have evolved from this, guys. We're actually in another another stratosphere, so to speak. We'll talk about that in just a moment, but the information age really started in 1960, guys, 1960 to 2007. That was the information age. The first satellite went up in 1962, and information started to spread across the globe, guys. It started becoming easier to gain access to information starting in 1960. Uh, GPS was developed during this information age. GPS was actually reserved for the military forever, for like over 20 years. I remember seeing GPS when I was serving in the Marines, and I was just fascinated. I was blown away by it. And, of course, fast forward to today, today's times, it's everywhere. GPS is everywhere now. It's in every vehicle that's sold now. It's it's on your phone. It's all over the place, right? It's everywhere now, but it, it was once reserved for the military. All uh, the World Wide Web came along during the information age. Uh, the a, a automatic teller machine, online banking and such, uh, you didn't have to physically walk into a bank anymore. You could actually do banking 
transactions through uh, an automatic teller machine or even online banking. Uh, the personal computer came along during this information age. Email, there's a novel concept. Uh, you know, turn back the clock, you know, 20 plus years, people were like, what do I need an email address for? You know, now you have to have one. You need one. I mean, you need it for anything. The cellular phone, they're, 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 they're you know, <laughs> you know, I, for those that remember the, the house phones that, you know, they hung on a wall or they, it was on a table or, some, or that kind of deal and you had a rotary dial or you had the push button. The, the cellular phone allowed you to just take that communication anywhere that you were. And once again, developed during the information age. And then something came along called social media. And this is actually relatively new, believe it or not. Um, social media went viral in 2010. It's been around longer than that, obviously. Yes, it's been around longer than that, but it went viral in 2010 another disruptive technology that came along during the information age. And now we're living in what I call the new media age from 2007 to the present. Okay. Now things have dramatically changed since 2007. I just want you to think back 10 years, which is not a long time ago. Think back just 10 years. What kind of vehicle were you driving? What was inside of that vehicle? as far as, you know, GPS and all this stuff they have in these vehicles now. What kind of phone were you carrying, right? Um, all that kind of stuff, guys. Things have, what kind of television did you have back then? Just 10 years ago, guys. And you, you think, look around your home and think about how things have changed and evolved so fast in the past, just 10 years, guys, just 10 years back. Just think back 10 years from now. Whatever date it is, whatever year it is, just think back 10 years how quickly Change, things have changed and we call this the new media I call this the new media age 2007 to the president and here's what happened in in basically recent times the availability of wi-fi and this was a huge one right here because now the internet was everywhere it wasn't just in your home or office wi-fi basically there was an internet connection everywhere you went I mean it was everywhere guys every you go to a bookstore, you go to a coffee shop, you go to a restaurant, anywhere you go, there's a Wi-Fi connection somewhere now. It's somewhere. And that's new technology, guys. It used to not be that way not that long ago. The smartphone, new technology, okay? Think back 10 years ago, you might have been carrying a flip phone still, right? Most of us were. Probably all of us were. Bitcoin came along. Bitcoin, that that internet money, right? Bitcoin. Some people are still not plugged into this, but they're coming, guys. Bitcoin is going to take over the world. And not just Bitcoin. There's other digital currencies that are going to take over the world. But this is something that's really brand new. Streaming, guys. Streaming, right? That's something brand new. New technology that's really taken off in the past 10 years. Uh, dating. Listen to this, guys. Most people, and of course, I don't even have to even tell you this. Most people actually meet online first before they meet in person. It, I mean, all the time. Think about it. Think about this, guys. Most people meet online first before meeting in person. Shopping, obviously. I mean, look at Amazon. I mean, look at eBay. Look at every single retailer that has a .com at the end of their name where you can shop. You can shop at Walmart.com. You can shop at anything you want. But people are just shopping online, guys, and retail is suffering. You look at companies like Sears and Kmart and Toys R Us and Foot Locker. They're all being crushed, guys. They're being crushed because they didn't adapt fast enough to uh, the new media age. Mobile apps, guys. We live in a time where we, you can actually download technology in, in a second, in a couple seconds onto your, onto your, uh, your mobile device. And that software can do a, a variety of things, whatever the purpose of it is. We live in a mobile app world now where you can just push a button and instantly you can complete a task. Transportation, also, uh, obviously, we, with mobile apps uh, connected to that also, you know, with companies like Uber, where you can actually push a button on your phone and get a ride somewhere. But this is what's going on, guys, in the new media age, and this is how... Things have evolved from the industrial age, from the tail end of the industrial age to the information age to the new media age. 
And noticing trends before uh, the masses is really how fortunes are made. And people, they do realize what is going on as far as technology, as far as the phone that they're holding in their hand or the technology that is in their home or in their office or at their workspace, what have you. But what people don't understand is how quickly the world is changing. They just don't understand it. They don't see it. And they don't wrap their mind around it. Maybe they're not self-aware. I, I really don't know. But the masses really do not know what's going on. And what I mean by that is, is if you look at the tail end of the industrial age in this chart right here, okay, and you see there was a marketing shift around 1960 where we went into, I'm sorry, where we went into the uh, industrial age to the information age. There was a market shift, okay? And then in 2007, there was another market shift where we go into, they're calling it the digital age. I call it the new media age, same thing. But here's what happened in 2000, right, right before 2007 or right around 2007, is innovation kicked in. And now innovation is just skyrocketing. Innovation, new technology, new ideas, new things being developed, right? And the world pretty much stayed the same between 1920 to, you know, until, you know, the end of the information age. Now, what I mean by that is the world's pretty much stayed the same. I mean, some of the technologies are the same. They just got more refined, okay? And if if you backtrack, if you backtrack to the industrial age, like the refrigerator, you know, it got better and better and better and better, right? Absolutely. But a new technology didn't come along to replace the refrigerator. The same thing with the radio. Of course, now we got satellite radio and all that kind of stuff, right? But it's still radio, guys. The, the concept is the same. You know, the washer just got better. The vacuum got better. The water heater got better. The everything you can think of, the automobiles got better. The air conditioning got better. Things got more efficient. Our homes are better built. They're better insulated. All that kind of stuff, guys. Plumbing is better now. Television, uh, anything you can think of. Yes, it got better and better and better and better for about 50, 60 years but no, we, we weren't really in a, a period where there was just massive innovation like there is now, okay? And this innovation, this spike in innovation started about 2007 time frame, okay? Well, there's just so many new ideas that are being implemented and these disruptive technologies are being adopt, uh, adopted. And some of them, are being adopted on a mass scale or they're at the tipping point where they're about to be adopted as a, uh, as a, as a, uh, there's going to be mass adoption. Okay. Some of them are not mass adopted yet. For example, like Bitcoin. Yes, there's 25 million wallets, but you know, that doesn't even mean 25 million people. So that's really something brand new. There hasn't been this mass adoption yet but it's coming it's definitely coming and i'm just using bitcoin as an example one of the technologies now are you ahead of trends the speed in which technology is advancing is accelerating and this is what people are not aware of the speed in which technology is advancing is accelerating things are changing faster it's not going to take 50 60 70 years for for these trends to develop and become refined it's already happening now. The world is changing faster than at any other point in history. Okay, entrepreneurs are forging a new way to exchange value, communicate ideas in a decentralized community. And we're going to talk, be talking about some of these terms. And those that learn new ideas the fastest capitalize. Now, in today's times, there's going to be some terms that you're going to want to know about. And you don't have to be an expert or anything like that, but you're going to want to know about these technologies. I promise you that because this technology is not going away. It's going to be mainstream. It's going to be everywhere. It's going to be part of pop culture. And mass adoption is coming, but most people do not know about these technologies. They just don't know about this stuff yet. Maybe they've heard of them, but they don't understand it, and they don't understand how it's going to impact their life. That's really the thing that they don't understand. How does cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, blockchain, uh, decentralized proof of work, proof of stake, delegated proof of stake, how do these disruptive technology, how are they going to impact my life? They're going to impact your life in a big time way. These are going to be connected. These technologies are going to be connected to 
everything in the very near future. And when I say everything, I mean everything, guys. This is going to be part of the internet. This is going to be the internet. This is going to be how everything is done, how people communicate, how people shop, how people bank, how people do absolutely everything. It's going to be connected to what is up on the screen right now. Everything's going to be coming to this. And I do mean everything. I know that might be hard to comprehend right now because it hasn't happened yet, but it's happening and it's going to happen. Let's talk about some of these terms real quick. Now, cryptocurrency, if you're not familiar with what the heck is cryptocurrency, it's simply digital money created from code, okay? It is an internet peer-to-peer -peer cash system that runs independent of central authority or oversight. It is a system of trust ran by entrepreneurs that is cheap proof, okay? All right, that's just uh, in layman's terms, guys, not real technical, okay? It's not usually issued by a central authority or government. Now, it can be, governments can create their own cryptocurrencies, okay? So it's not exclusive to entrepreneurs. It could be created by a central authority or government, okay? Um, cryptocurrency has no tangible form, but wallet keys can be printed on paper. Now, what that means is it's like credits on a screen, right? You got keys, and the keys represent value, and those keys can be printed out like you can have them printed out on paper and have it in your wallet. You could have cryptocurrency keys printed on paper, So, but it's really, there's no tangible form of cryptocurrency. Now, some nicknames for cryptocurrency, you probably heard of some of these or all of these or most of these, Satoshi, coin, a lot of people say, hey, you have any coin? And they're talking about digital currency, digital gold, digital cash, digital credits, internet money, uh, crypto, you hear crypto quite a bit, digits, I hear some people say that word, digits, uh, electronic currency and virtual currency, it all means the same thing. Now, one of the advantages to, to this is it cannot be spent twice. One transact, once a transaction is confirmed, it uh, cannot be reversed. Every node records the record to the database, which becomes part of the permanent blockchain public ledger. Now, every node, what that means is every computer, if the node is a computer, uh, that records the record to the database. So basically, it's a public permanent ledger you know you can't really see the books to a lot of things to government to fortune 500 companies to whatever guys all kinds of stuff right well this is public you can actually see this guys and it's permanent and it can't really be messed with we'll talk about this a little more in detail now the benefits of crypto is it's fast it's irreversible there's low fees there's no third party involved it's universal there's some privacy uh, attached to it uh, it represents freedom and there's unlimited transaction amount also entrepreneurs can you know accept whatever they want to accept for payment they don't have to accept a a fiat currency so to speak they can accept whatever they want to uh, accept but cryptocurrency is really um, I want to say it's it's the money of the future but it's not even the money of the future because it's already here today and it's already extremely valuable and those that hold cryptocurrency you already know this now bitcoin was the first successful digital money created in 2008 by satoshi nakamoto nobody knows who satoshi is but he devised a new electronic cash system that's fully peer-to-peer -peer with no trusted third party now, users, if anyone wants to get involved in Bitcoin or purchase something with Bitcoin or trade with Bitcoin or accept Bitcoin as payment, the first thing you must do is you must set up a Bitcoin wallet, okay? You got to have a Bitcoin wallet to purchase, trade, sell, or exchange value using Bitcoin. So to get started in Bitcoin, the very first step, if you're brand new, just look at this for the very first time is setting up a wallet. That's it guys, that you have to set up a wallet, which is pretty simple to do, pretty easy, and it's free guys, it doesn't really cost nothing. All right, now, the main use, utility, and utility is what is Bitcoin used for, okay? Now, I don't think Bitcoin was, it, so Satoshi intended Bitcoin to be used for this. Now you can use it for just about anything guys, I mean, I'll accept it for anything, for payment, if you buy, 
if you wanted to buy my truck and I said, okay, cash or Bitcoin, I would take Bitcoin or cash. Matter of fact, I prefer Bitcoin. And I might even give you a discount if you pay me in Bitcoin. But, you know, uh, you can buy stuff. You can go to overstock.com and per make purchases with Bitcoin. You, you can spend it just about anywhere. There's a lot of places you can spend it. But the utility, now what are most people using it for? The utility, most people are purchasing other cryptocurrencies, okay, right now. But that may not always be the case, okay, because some people are spending it. They are purchasing things with it. I've, I've bought some things with it. But I'm really a holder and I'm a collector and I'm really trying to accumulate as much of it as possible because I know how powerful it is, just my own personal strategy. But the main utility for Bitcoin right now is purchasing other cryptocurrencies. Of course, that may change going forward into the future, which I know it'll change. It'll start becoming used more and more and more. But it's kind of like, it's kind of like the gold. They call it uh, digital gold. It's the gold of cryptocurrencies. Okay. Now, uh, it's independent. It's ind now, it is an independent network of computers across the globe. And what they do is they compete against each other to verify transactions. This is called mining. And the computer that verifies the transaction the fastest is rewarded new Bitcoin, okay? So how Bitcoin works in simple terms, okay? There's computers all across the globe. And these computers, they compete against each other when someone wants to spend Bitcoin, all right? And the, the computer that verifies that transaction the fastest, they call this mining, okay? And that computer that verifies it, they get rewarded some new Bitcoin, okay? That's how it works, guys. Now, Bitcoin is decentralized, meaning no one owns it. Nobody owns Bitcoin. It's decentralized. Now, if you have the keys, well, obviously, you own some Bitcoin if you have the keys to Bitcoin, the private keys. Now... Bitcoin only, can only be spent once. All transactions are final and they cannot be reversed. So there's just a really basic, basic, basic overview of Bitcoin. Okay. And of course, Bitcoin is limited. There are only going to be 21 million Bitcoin ever. And you don't have to buy a whole coin. You can buy a fraction of a coin and it breaks down uh, to, uh, you can research this. It breaks down to very minute uh, decimals, you can break it down. They call Satoshi like one millionth of a Bitcoin. So it's a nickname for it. But anyway, it's limited, guys. And that's what makes it so valuable is because there's a limited supply. I call Bitcoin uh, uh, money in reverse because it's limited. You know, fiat currency is unlimited. Governments print money like nonstop. It's, it's insane, guys. It's, you know, and it's, there's always this danger of hyperinflation because there's too much currency in circulation. Okay, blockchain. Blockchain is a global network of computers that jointly manage a database of records. Okay, that's there it is in simple terms. A global network of computers that jointly manage a database of records. Since there's no central authority, this public ledger is decentralized. It cannot be altered. Computers connected to a network called nodes also maintain an exact copy okay all right now it's digitalized decentralized public ledger managed by nodes node is a computer guys okay that's all it is so if you hear these terms what the heck's a node a node is a computer man it's a computer that's running the blockchain okay all right nodes are simply computers connected to a network okay so they're all plugged in guys they're all plugged in but one computer is not like senior to the other okay they're all the same, guys, because they got the same set of records stored on that computer. This stuff is really simple when you boil it down, guys, okay? Now, we can get really technical and, and analyze this and confuse ourselves, but I'm telling you, this stuff is really simple. Once you wrap your mind around it, you're going to understand it. And you, listen, you don't need to understand everything about it either, okay? You just need to understand that it works and have a basic understanding of it. Like, most people don't understand how the internet works, Yet they use the internet every day. Yet they don't go to Google and Google search it all day long saying, well, how does this internet work? How do we, when I type in something, how does it connect? And, you know, all this kind of, they, they don't understand all that stuff. But the bottom line is it works. Now, all nodes have the exact same records or recorded blocks. This is kind of like the transaction history. So all the nodes have the exact same transaction history and you can't change it guys you can't manipulate it you can't cheat it if you change one you got to change all how are you going to change them all you see how this is 
This is really pretty awesome technology because it can't be messed with. You know, entrepreneurs are really sick and tired of the way things are being ran by central authority, whether it be a company or a government or whatever it is, an agency. And they came up with this technology called blockchain. Like, the heck with this. We're going to come up with a system that can't be messed with. It can't be, you can't cook the books. You can't cheat. You can't steal. You can't lie. I mean, the transaction history is public. Everybody can see it. Now, the benefits of this technology, transparency, which I touched on, security, traceability, efficiency, and speed. Oops, sorry about that, guys. And, okay, that was it for that slide. And let's give you guys a real a visual so you can wrap your mind around this and you can see really how simple this works. Let's just say I'm A and you're B. And what I want to do is I want to spend some Bitcoin. I want to I want to buy something from you. And let's just say for this example, it costs $100, okay? So I'm going to spend $100 in Bitcoin. And I, that that computer up there represents me, the laptop. I'm A and B. You're 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 B. You're the block, okay? And I want to and I want to spend $100 in Bitcoin. I want to buy something from you. What happens is that gets broadcasted out to these computers all across the globe. They're called nodes. And this is decentralized, right? And all these computers, what they're doing is they're competing to validate that transaction, okay? They're using an algorithm, and I'm not going to get into breaking all that down, but they're competing to verify that transaction, okay? There's a mathematical equation that they're, they're attempting to solve. Now, once that thing is solved, okay, it's going to get, cre it's going to get added to a, or created. There's going to be a new block created that's going to get added to the block once it's confirmed, okay? And then that computer is going to be re rewarded a transaction fee, and actually, they're going to get some new Bitcoin, right? Going to get some new Bitcoin that's going to be created. This is called mining, okay? And then the transaction complete, completes, okay? So that's really a basic overview picture of how it works. Even if you don't fully understand it, it works, guys, okay? You don't really have to understand it every single step involved, but that's really basic, and that's just a good visual picture of showing you how this works and you can already probably see the advantages of this right there's huge advantages because you got this network of computers that are competing to verify the transaction and then it goes on a public ledger every computer up there has the same exact ledger okay it's like bookkeeping a ledger right and that ledger can't be manipulated it can't be changed it can't be cheated it can't be you know you can't cook the books and all this other kind of stuff guys it's it, it's decentralized that's the awesome thing about this technology. And this is how Bitcoin works, guys. And a lot of the cryptocurrencies, this is how they work, okay? Just a basic bird's eye view of how this technology works. Okay, and this illustration could represent all the computers all across the globe. You can see they could be anywhere, right? They could be anywhere doing this kind of stuff. And this is called decentralized, right? Decentralized. Okay, and decentralized is nothing more than the, the dispersion or distribution of functions and authority, meaning it's not in one office. The information is not on one computer. The information is not in control of one person or one company or anything else. It's the sharing of responsibility in a network that equally distributes power. I'm going to tell you guys, we're going to see technologies that haven't even come forward yet. Well, actually, some of them have. You're going to see things like social media that's decentralized. You're going to see all kind of stuff, guys, that's decentralized. And a lot of it, some of it's already around, guys. It's already here. It's already here today. But you're going to see more and more things that are decentralized. And the reason is because people are going to trust this system. You're going to be able to trust this system because you can't cheat the system. So I'm telling you guys. Everything in the world is going to this. And I mean everything is going to this. You will see. Now, it is a program system of trust that cannot be manipulated, cheated, or changed. Okay? And what we're doing here, it's a transfer of the decision-making power and assignment of accountability, removing ownership and control from a single authoritative source. Power to the people or group in an equal and trusted way. These are some of the benefits, guys. The decision making that is distributed or delegated away from a central authority, location, or group. 
authoritative location or group. A system of integrity that enforces honesty. Like I said, you can't cheat it. You can't lie. You can't manipulate it. All that kind of stuff. So let this concept, let this disruptive technology, let it sink in, guys. And once it sinks in, the light bulb will go off. I'm telling you, this stuff is fascinating, guys. It's all I can think about all the time. All right, we'll talk about briefly about proof of work. And this is what this is what Bitcoin uses, okay? This is a system of decentralized nodes. And you guys know that nodes are computers. So it's a system of computers that are competing to confirm transactions. We touched on this, right? And by solving a mathematical equation, the first to validate and authenticate the answer to the mathematical puzzle wins. These nodes, also known as miners, you hear the word miners, are incentivized to keep confirming transactions and awarded new cryptocurrency as payment, okay? So if you hear the term proof of work, this is exactly what it means. And this is exactly what's going on. This is a real simplified definition of proof of work, okay? And these people are called, or these computers, it's called mining, okay? You might hear the terms mining Bitcoin or mining some other coin. Well, this is what they're doing, guys. Okay, now this usually requires special equipment and it's expensive. You got to use high energy costs uh, to complete these mathematical equations. It's highly secure and virtually impossible to hack. Uh, it eliminates the double spend problem. You can only spend the money once when proof of work it's decentralized, like I showed in the illustration, a global network of nodes. And what is that? Uh, computers, right? All across the globe, guys, nodes. All right, now we'll talk a little bit about proof of stake. And this is similar, It's but it's a different model. It's a different way of verifying the transactions uh, on the blockchain. And this is a protocol for validating cryptocurrency transactions. It removes mining. Mining requires expensive computers and energy costs. And proof of stake derives from actual holdings of the cryptocurrency. Stakeholders may be given the option of running a master node. In this model, stake able wallet coins are locked up during blockchain transaction sets. Now, what this means in simple terms is in Bitcoin mining, none of those miners have to hold Bitcoin. They don't have to have Bitcoin to mine new Bitcoin, to make new Bitcoin. They don't have to be holding it. They can just complete the transaction and get rewarded new Bitcoin. Well, with proof of stake, you actually have to hold the coin in a wallet. You stake that coin, meaning you lock it up. It's kind of like security deposit for the network. Okay, that's an easy way for me to explain it, right? And because you have stake in the network, well, you may have the option of being a master node, or maybe you can vote for a master node. I don't want to get too deep into this, but because that these, these master nodes have stake in the network, they're able to complete these transactions, okay? It's just, it's, the, it's just a different way of doing it, guys, okay? And don't let it confuse you. You can research this further. I'm giving you a very basic uh, definition here. Now, in POS, the coins are pre-mined, so therefore, there's no new coins being created from the validation. Now, the participants are called forgers instead of miners. Now, they're still doing the same thing. They're validating the transactions, but they're called forgers instead of miners, in this consensus model, the forger who acts as the validator is determined by the amount of coins held in the stake or the age of the stakeholder's holdings, okay? And I know that's quite a bit, but it, in simple terms, once again, it's it, it, a, val, a, a forger uh, or acts as a validator, and basically that person they may have a huge stake, meaning they have a lot of the coins, a lot of the cryptocurrency, and they are holding that as, or they may, and, and of course it goes by seniority. You could have a seasoned account that could also come into play. <clears throat> Say, for example, you have someone, you know, with a with 10,000 coins of a certain cryptocurrency, and another person has 10,000 coins of the cryptocurrency, but the other person has a more seasoned account well, that person is going to have a little more seniority, right? All right, now, 
The stake act as as X as a security deposit for the network or as collateral to vouch for the blocks. The stakeholder is paid with transaction fees. Okay, so it's just a really different way of doing uh, cryptocurrency validation or uh, confirming the transactions on the network. The stakeholders are doing the transactions. They call those they could you call those master nodes or nodes, what have you. But it works the same way, guys. It's really actually pretty simple when it boils down all right and the higher the stake the more validating power the stakeholder has okay all right and there's just a simple illustration uh proof of work miners they're actually mining new coin right they're creating new coin forgers have the key they're staking their coins it's kind of like they're locking up their coins in a stake i'm sorry sorry in a safe right they're in a safe and they're forging new coins. Now, you also may hear some other terms for forgers. You may hear validators, okay? Same thing. It means the same thing. Validators, forgers. And um, you also may hear the word delegates, okay? Delegates, forgers. You may also hear that kind of stuff, guys. It all means the same thing, all right? Um, but it's a little different than mining, mining coins, but... It's just a different way of doing it, guys, of validating the transactions on the network. It's pretty simple once you wrap your mind about it. Once again, first time you see this, you might be, oh, I'm a little confused, but just watch it a few times, guys. It'll sink in. You'll, you, once you've been around cryptocurrency, you'll start to absorb this, this information, this technology. You know, the, the internet was very confusing at one time. You know, email was very confusing at one time. Social media was very confusing at one time. And you know, switching over to a smartphone was confusing at one time, but you grasp this stuff pretty fast once you see it in action. Okay, proof of work notes known as miners are paid in the creation of new coins. Proof of stake nodes known as forgers, also known as validators, are and they are paid uh, the transaction fee. Okay, now the way in which a miner or forger node confirms transactions and how those nodes are incentivized to do so is the main distinction between proof of work and proof of stake. It's just a different way of doing business, guys. It's all it is. All right, there's also something called delegated proof of stake. It's very similar to proof of stake. The only difference is stakeholders vote for delegates in a democratic way, okay? And every wallet can potentially vote for delegates uh the vote weight is uh proportionate to the wallet's stake in the network and what that means is you know if uh someone holds a lot of coins well they're going to have more voting power in the delegates that actually do the transactions for the network okay it's just a democratic way of doing the taking care of the transactions on the network uh, the stake act as acts as a security deposit for the network. Basically, they're locking up their coins. They can't spend their coins, trade their coins if they're a stakeholder, right? Delegates, also known as validators, generate new blocks. I mentioned that in the previous uh, slide. You may hear the word validator, okay? It means the same thing, guys. It means the same thing. Uh, they validate the transactions on the network and generate fees as a profit, okay? So they're basically doing the work guys they're they're uh they're validating the transactions and they get paid a uh a validation fee or merchant fee or whatever the heck it is you guys want to call it network fee whatever you guys want to call it they're getting paid uh fees to uh run the uh run the network <coughs> okay the validators are, are called forgers not miners we already talked about this and it's lightning fast, guys. It's very fast compared to um, proof of work. It's really fast because you got to think about it. With proof of work, there's computers all across the globe. They're all competing against each other. And uh, this is lightning fast, guys, compared to uh, the other model. Very low cost, no special equipment required. Okay, now let's just recap real quick, guys. Let's, let's recap a little bit. We, we talked about cryptocurrency, okay? What cryptocurrency is, uses for cryptocurrency, that kind of the deal. Uh, we talked a little bit about Bitcoin, talked about blockchain, decentralized proof of work, 
and proof of stake, guys. Also, delegated proof of stake. And these are some terms that I would jot these down. You're definitely going to want to look into this a little further. You're definitely going to want to, for those that are interested, if you really want to wrap your mind around this technology, uh, this disruptive technology, because this stuff is literally going to be everywhere. It's going to take over everything. It's going to be in every market, uh, every company, every product, every service, anything you can think of, guys. The entertainment uh, industry, uh, government, um, good gosh. I mean, it, uh, social media. I mean, it can go on and on and on and on and on, guys. This is the future today. It's already here, guys. It's just being, there's not mass adoption yet, but it's coming, guys. It's coming. Just like the internet came and there was mass adoption and social media came and there was mass adoption and cryptocurrency came along and I wouldn't call it mass adoption yet, but it's at the tipping point, guys. It's at the tipping point. And the rest of these technologies, it's the same thing, guys. It's already here. It's it's just teetering on the point where there's going to be mass adoption. There's no way it's going to, there's nothing that's going to stop it, guys. Nothing at all. Now, for those of you that do not have a Bitcoin wallet, okay, this is 100% free. There's nothing to buy ever. I've got training for you guys over on planetmillionaire.com and also put a link below this video, possibly a button below this video, depending upon where you're watching this video. But I'll give you a couple different ways to get to this, this training. And the first thing you're going to want to do is set up a Bitcoin wallet. Even if you don't plan on using it, I would set one up anyway. Kind of like, you know, you set up an email address when you first got exposed to the internet, whenever that was, right? Maybe you didn't use that email address right away, but you're going to, you're going to need to be, you're, you're going to need it eventually. Okay. I promise you, you're going to need a Bitcoin wallet eventually. If you don't have one now, you will need one. It's not a matter of if it's only a matter of when you will need one. So I'm going to give you guys this free training, hundred percent free cost you absolutely nothing. You guys can visit planetmillionaire.com to gain access or I'll put like a, a link below this video or possibly a button or something like that and get you guys connected to that training, let you guys plug in and learn more. All right, that's going to conclude this training. Frank Collabra Jr. signing off. Thank you.